yes, I do have a fascination uh, on waters and on rivers, according to my life experience. And uh, my research is on the water. And uh, although the um, title of my today's talk uh, is Yangtze Waters, a Social and Environmental History of the Jiang Han Plan. And that title actually was given by a very brilliant person. And so you have my biggest thanks uh, uh, for giving me this title. And my real interest is on the water and uh, social structures uh, in Chinese history. And so um, the time period is 1600 to 1900, which we call a whole unit of late imperial China and probably extending to the early Republican period of China. That is the first part of the 20th century. And studying this period, uh, it's the last dynasty, basically, and of China, the Qin dynasty, and with the most extensive sources, and which uh, uh, has been explored by a lot of historians in the field. And so, and it's one of the most vibrant field as well. Uh, there are some discussions about the periodizations and the be before the 19th century, after the 19th century, onset of the ecological crisis in China, which I uh, will talk about later, like uh, in my project. And this is, uh, uh, I want to give you a continuation from last week's talk by Professor Cao, that uh, she was examining actually in the water shortage area and how the city tried to borrow the water and have the fresh water, drinking water in the city. And this is the dry area and in the north, northwest, and this is the raining area. And uh, uh, while well, this is with the excessive rainfall and the excessive water, which is the region I'm examining now today. So, uh, right, and uh, this is a 1820 map uh, generated from the GIS database. Uh, 1820, as you can see, it's, uh, the boundaries are quite a little bit different and uh, um, has been changed a little bit. And in the center, that is the uh, yellow block, that is the region I'm examining, the uh, Hubei province. And uh, the red line is um, the Han River um, of the Jiang Han Plain, running through the whole uh, Hubei province. And this is a larger map of uh, the Jiang Han, uh, of Hubei province, and the Jiang Han Plain is at the lower reaches of uh, the Hubei province. And this is, uh, as you can see, the lines at the top The lines, this is the Han River, and this is the Yangtze River. And uh, there is some missing, actually, the data is missing from the, the historical sources when they generated the, the historical JS database. So that is need to be reconstructed. And the boundary, actually, are the administrative boundaries. And those are the prefectural boundaries, and the, those are the human boundaries. And uh, this is, uh, as you can see, the river runs through the human boundaries. And the Jiang Han Plain is at the lower reaches of this part of the whole Hubei. So my focus is how the, is, is bottom up, is completely situated in, in the local societies. And uh, I analyze how the local communities manage the water resources and uh, how local communities collaborated on the dike constructions and the managing the dikes, repair the dikes, and uh, solving the conflict. So it's completely on the uh, local hydraulic communities. And uh, that um, would we have to situate the, the, the project, the significance of the project. In the bigger picture, bigger scholarship, that you can see that uh, this is the uh, Dayu, the Great Yu. In Chinese uh, mythology, that is who uh, diverted the waters and uh, controlled the water and solved the flooding problems thousands of years ago. This is uh, considered as the ancestor of water conservancy in China, Shui Li, the water controller. And so um, 
one important foundational work is Carl Wittfogel's um, um, the, um, Oriental despotism that one or two a few uh, people at the top of the society had the completed control of the local water constructions. And as you can see, this is artistic uh, representation. In China, it's the court paintings and uh, to portray how the water was controlled in China, that there's authoritative person that is had the completed control of the waters, the irrigation ditches and overseeing uh, the labors and the work. And this is uh, as a challenge trying to compare with the water control and the other natural resources exploitations that in the wood, uh, deforestation, cutting of the wood, that you can see that also there is authoritarian person that what has been portrayed in the court art. However, this is only an artistic portrait. That is in the image of uh, the Chinese emperors and uh, the, the rulers. They trying to see themselves as the authoritarian person and had the complete control of nature, of natural resources that in fact, the water control in China, they have different modes. The scholars categorized um, five different modes of the water control in Chinese societies. And the first is, you can see that the large scale, the large scale water control project, and at the other, the vertical, means the autonomous was state controlled. So the first is large scale water control and uh, complete under the state administration. That is, uh, well, we'll say the cases will be the Yellow River administration as the cradle of Chinese civilizations and as the symbol of Chinese political cycles, the dynastic cycle and connected with the control of the Yellow River administration. If there's a flood or not, and if the river was controlled very well. So the first was large scale and the state controlled Yellow River administration. And the second uh, was a small scale, scale state controlled with critical sections on the provincial uh, in, the, in different provinces, critical sections of the river dikes in different provinces. So, and this, uh, the third one is more autonomous and uh, in the big polders and uh, has been examined by scholars, um, especially in the south. And there's the Sai Yuan Li polders examined um, by scholar Mark Elvin that inside the lineages had the complete control uh, of the polder administrations and they control the waters. Mm -hmm. And they have the public election and they were considered as proto-democracy uh, in China, the practice. And uh, the fourth, is the autonomous and the smaller is more the irrigation ditches, very small scale irrigation ditches, completely under the control of the peasant. And uh, the fifth one is more towards the um, middle, the small towards middle scale, and um, is more towards autonomous control of the water, but it was not completely from, uh, free from the state control. So basically, Zhang Han Plan is a case of the fifth model that has the competition, negotiation, manipulation from the local communities and, and, and uh, will have the power discourse with the state from above and in the water construction dike management. So in this region, the dike management actually had the, is a dual one, that uh, the official dike and the people's dike. And the official dike is, um, uh, is supervised by the officials. Um, however, it was called official dike, but was completely managed and financed by the people themselves. It's only it's just uh, supervised by the officials and appeared on the registration. And, uh, and there is a people's dike and also has a name is private dike as has been uh, well constructed by um, the people themselves and the management by the people themselves. So in this region, the Jiang Han Plan, the dike work, dike management mostly are based in the local societies, the local communities.
Um, so talking about the, the Jiang Han plan and the Jiang Han plan, the topology, uh, topology of the plan and is a little bit tilted. And it's uh, let's go back to um, the. So it has the uh, mountain ranges around the north and the west, and it is a little bit tilted towards the south. So when the rain falls, and from April to September for each year, is the subtropical weather climate pattern that has uh, three flood seasons lasting from April and to September. And uh, excessive rainfall would come down from the upper stream of the Yangtze and the Han rivers, and in here, you will see it's large areas of wetland and the lakes in these areas. So it's a marshy uh, condition of the Jiang Han Plain. And in here, especially at the tip, they have a very heavy flooding problems and the drainage problems. And all, all the water will come down over here and it stays if the water was not released in a timely fashion. So it has the drainage problems and the flooding calamities, and so made the Jiang Han society facing a lot of uh, the pressures and like, uh, um, well, how to dealing with the frequent flooding calamities and the drainage problems. So one way to survive in the region that is to build the circular dikes and the, the Yuan, which we, we call Yuan, and uh, the different uh, suggestions on the name, the enclosures or uh, polders that were the more like universal and more understandable for just using as the polder communities in this uh, in this area. So it's a circular, uh, it's circular dikes and with the paddy fields uh, cultivating rice and with the, uh, the household inside the circular dikes. And many of the, of the polders, they share the dikes. And so they have a lot of collaborations on the dike management. And they based on, uh, they divide the dike work based on the land they own, each of the polders they own. And uh, uh, for example, they, uh, in the proportion, they were four to six on the dike work, or three to seven, or is on negotiation is very accurately up to three digit after the point, like a 3.725. So it's very accurate in the, in the uh, customs and uh, the, in the local institutions that manage the dikes. And uh, the sluice gates and uh, to control the water and so for the irrigation. So in this marsh uh, condition of the Jiang Han Plan, and the people can, uh, build the dikes and build the, the polders, reclaim the land for agricultural cultivation. And when the flood comes and when there is a, a very severe drainage problems, actually their lifestyles change because of the circular dikes are very low and uh, they are easily to be flooded. When there is a flooded, it's just the water that became a lake. So their lifestyle is very flexible. It's a, I call it the amphibians lifestyle. So when there's no flood and they reside in the houses and they conduct agriculture activity and uh, cultivating rice and when there's no flood and uh, when there is flood and the drainage sometimes can last uh, for several years and they just abandon the house and, uh, and go on the boat and so, and start fishing and they rely on the aquatic plants. So it's kind of a flexible lifestyle in this area. And so this is a Jiao Pai, uh, that is one of the kind of housing boat that uh, is just for the people to live on it. And uh, they uh, use the bamboo and uh, the ki uh, a kind of water resistant grass and to make this uh, the housing boat. And they basically conduct every possible family activities on the boat uh, when there was a flood and uh, the drainage problems. For example, they marry, the kids, children on the Jiao Pai, and they raise animals and they plant vegetables and they have funerals. So every uh, single the family activities, they will just uh, uh, be on the, 
this uh, flexible and a moving boat in the lifestyle. So uh, if I talk about this because of the boundaries are not uh, uh, fixed, okay, the borders, the boundaries are not fixed. And uh, there's so people are frequently are changing their lifestyles and so the belongings, they have their own identities in the communities. And so it's uh, basically they, um, uh, well, build the temples, constructed temples, so worshiping God and the goddesses in the certain temples to provide a public space for them to have a cultured nature, a cultured community in that area. So, um, so this is, uh, uh, well, I, this is one of the temples I went to actually in the Jianghan Plan, and uh, this is a newly constructed temple that uh, just a reflection, those are actually the stories of Journey to the West. <laughs> Last time, uh, Professor Cao actually mentioned that at the end of the talk, Nanmu Temple, and for each boulder, that if you look at a historical document, each boulder, they had they worship a certain kind of god or goddesses in each boulder. And so basically created the platform for people to have the cohesive cultural identities uh, in, the, in the community. And uh, um, so, and they, they worship also a diversity type of god and goddesses. It's different, each of the boulders are different. And so uh, this is created a syncretic field. So in that area that the people have the strong kind of a cultural liaisons, coincidence together in the community and they have the flexible lifestyles. So basically you will say the local forces, activisms and um, their voices from the commoners are, are very, very strong. And to the extent to uh, be uh, um, defiant against the state power. This is another temple of the Great Yu, actually along the Yangtze River. And I just want to show it to you. And um, if you look at the critical sections of the uh, river dikes management in this area, for each critical sections, there's going to be a temple or an um, iron bull, which, uh, which is supposed to sedate the flood and the word uh, pagoda, and so it's basically it's on the critical sections of the dike management. Uh, so um, this is a temple along the Yangtze River, which um, uh, when the 1870, the biggest Yangtze flooding in six centuries um, happened, and uh, the flood actually left the, the traces on the poles of the temple. So this uh, came from last year. So this is come, so we have the Jiangkhan society and it's uh, kind of is based on the, the people had a strong uh, kind of a proto-democratic and uh, autonomous management of uh, their, their um, well, uh, dikes and, uh, and the waters. And so when it comes to the state that the last dynasty of China actually that uh, had different episodes of the policies and they trying to incorporate uh, the local communities into its own legit um, space. So it's trying to settle people and incorporate the local communities into the state. So for, at the very uh, early stage of the reconstruction of the Qing dynasty, it's around 1600, 1700. And so it's uh, well encouraging the land recommendations and exempting the tax from the peasant and so that to increase the agricultural cultivation, production, and to settle people. The many of the refugees and the beggars and those people, which were the dangerous element for the state stability. So they're trying to encourage those people to cultivate those land. And so it's encouragement and this is uh, one of the early emperors and uh, especially inscribed the, the order that you have to conduct agricultural uh, cultivation as much as possible, cultivating rice. And this is uh, so the um, kind of uh, encouragement. And so uh, my project is kind of the tension uh, and the negotiation and kind of competition between the state 
is trying to these efforts trying to intrude into the, the local communities which uh, created this kind of uh, the power discourse and the tensions between uh, the two sides. Um, so, um, and my focus is several of the project. I discussed several projects uh, um, uh, chronologically that from the land recommendation, the uh, um, people settlement project from the early chain and then to one of the projects I'm going to talk about, uh, the, the garrison, the, the military garrison stayed for local control in that area and how it's failed uh, through the case of the horses. And uh, I talk about the local miniaturization, uh, like at the local level, but it's a state imposed the local miniaturization, how it's involved hydraulic communities into the vast expensive military activities and we're fighting against the rebellions uh, in the middle of 19th century. And I talk about how this kind of decentralized uh, water management and hydraulic communities was finally incorporated uh, into the state and uh, into a kind of a watershed management in the early 20th century. So this is a kind of, I, I discussed the individual project and throughout uh, the Qing times. Uh, so, I don't know how much minute I have right now. So um, this project, the uh, one of the project that is discussed is about uh, the Qianlong Emperor during the 18th century, with a century at the expensive um, uh, population growth and with a lot of land being uh, reclaimed, and with uh, the area was uh, having experiencing a large population pressure, and uh, the river lake system, the rivers and uh, with the lake system, because many of the lakes, are, uh, they were reclaimed by the people. So it's uh, kind of the shrinking. And uh, so the river lake systems is kind of a tightened tensions uh, during that time period. And um, the state actually wanted to conserve the river lake systems, uh, forbidden um, the reclaim and the build of the polders. Uh, uh, in the 18th century, after the middle 18th century, and um, but the, there's a couple of complicated elements and the reasons, and which had a little bit ethnic touch uh, in the in the project. And so um, the emperor, the Manchu people, the last dynasty of China, the Manchu people, actually they were semi-nomadic. They came from the northeastern part of China and conquered China proper. China proper is the majority of the Han Chinese people um, uh, lived, stayed, and for experience different dynasties. And so the, the, the Manchu and the Han, the tensions has been all throughout the whole dynasty and it became the proto-force the, for the nationalism. When the later, when we talk about the nationalism rise in China, actually they wanted to eliminate the Manchus first and then goes to the foreigners later. So this is a Manchu and Han tensions played a role uh, in the water conservation and also the horse uh, pasture land um, uh, decision making of the Han, uh, of the Manchu uh, um, rulers at the time. So for the local control, the Jinzhou garrison, that is, uh, they established this kind of the garrison, military garrison uh, project in the region. And in, in Jinzhou, actually just along the Yangtze River, a very critical section of the Yangtze River. And uh, they have the city, it's Manchu city, as you can see, the Chinese city and the, the Manchu city, they're segregated together. And the Manchus, because of their identity, they um, had um, the complete, they have the package and they're speaking Manchu languages and is uh, the time? The, and and uh, also the um, uh, archery and also riding the horses. So horses are so important for them and they, after they set up the Manchu, uh, the Jinzhou garrison, they set up the horse pasture land along the, the flood plants because of the horses need the, the water and the, the grasses and for the grazing and so for the horses to live. 
so the large areas horse pasture land had the conflict with the e e expansion of the Han Chinese peasant. They were trying to reclaim the land. So that's become a strategic space. And uh, out of the Manchu Han tension that the, the Qin state is trying to settle the Han Chinese peasant in the 18th century, that uh, the Qin uh, state decided to uh, eliminate all the uh, horse pasture land in this, in this region and also decrease the number of the horses in this region. So basically, uh, you will see the number of horses uh, across this time period that has been continuously decreasing in this area. So this is one of the projects that I was discussing, actually. So in, uh, uh, well, it's uh, kind of a talk about this tension for all the projects I'm discussing, that uh, it's, it's all this tension that the state trying to incorporate and the local community is actually trying to resist that uh, kind of incorporate tension like uh, throughout different projects. And this is the last one actually is, uh, uh, well, it's kind of uh, uh, trying to deal with the snail fever, uh, scomiasis, uh, I think the disease, and uh, um, for land recombination. And uh, during the Great Leap Forward is after 1949, the, and uh, the polders communities, the boundaries were completely redrawn and uh, reorganized. So that is how the story actually ended uh, as a kind of epilogue. And this is uh, just I want to share some of the sedimentation from the Jinjiang River. This is one section of um, the Yangtze, that this pagoda that is uh, um, it's for uh, centuries, 400? Yeah, past few centuries, 403, uh, uh, more than 400 years. So it uh, has been sunken. It's because the Yangtze River's made sedimentation and made the pagoda uh, sunk in and below the, the water, the dike um, level. And uh, so that you can show the hydromorphological, the movement of the Yangtze River um, that you go, that uh, how it's uh, affected um, kind of um, the human societies. Um, um, I think, uh, so I was going to talk a little bit more about my current, the second project, but I think I'm just going to uh, pass it since the time probably is already passed. I don't know. Now you made us interested in <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, the waterways, the waterway transportation in China that uh, it's, it's a GIS map for the Kodi the rivers. <laughs> and not all of them are navigable, but uh, for the, this region, the Yangtze and the, and the Han actually are quite uh, navigable. And my attention would be, uh, so this is uh, Wuhan actually. Right? This is Wuhan. This is Wuhan that, uh, yeah, the Yangtze River, and the ways you will see the transportations uh, around this region. But uh, I will examine uh, the after uh, the middle 19th century when the foreigners came in, actually the scientific investigation for the waterways to start with the British. And many of the water hydraulic projects uh, in China, in, in Wuhan, was hybrid knowledge. It's, uh, some of the, uh, the constructions will go through like five different uh, uh, experts and from five different countries. And so it's a hybrid knowledge of um, the hydraulics in the, since the starting the middle 19th century that I want to look at. And so um, this is uh, the waterway, the earliest uh, uh, three gorges. And this is last year I was there and saw the, uh, anyhow, so so the uh, people and they have the wedding photos on there. I just wonder how this the really big Magadam construction the state sponsored and has affected the people's daily life. How has it changed the private life of, of people? Yeah. So thank you. That's what we all. <laughs>